Speaker, someone says again. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, really express my gratitude to the two statesmen who came up with this idea that they will try the promise of our constitution by improving it uh, when necessary. Mr. Speaker, the promoters of this bill went out of their way. Mr. Speaker, under very difficult circumstances, no one imagined that Raila Amolo Dinga, Prime Minister, and Uru Kenyatta President would shake hands and would agree on a single path forward. And so I think it's something that's commendable, and we congratulate them for this singular achievement. Mr. Speaker, I'll speak to this bill in three uh, major you know, topics. One, I'll look at the process, Mr. Speaker, then I'll talk about the provisions in the bill, and then I will give my commendation on what I think should be done going forward. Mr. Speaker, the bill and the handshake had very good intentions. I was out of this parliament when the two gentlemen shook hands, biting my way back in. So when I came back in, I found a house that was so divided, a house that had been chunked into BBI and anti-BBI, a house where members singly in their own opinions decided that this is a BBI proponent, this is a BBI opponent, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, for three years, for two years now, this House, Mr. Speaker, has been divided that way. And I'm so happy that this whole division has come to an end by this bill now finally coming. Mr. Speaker, I have witnessed the blackmail, the intimidation, Mr. Speaker, that members of this House have gone through when this was going on, Mr. Speaker. Some of them lost their leadership positions in the committee. Some of them, Mr. Speaker, you go to a, to a minister and they ask you whether you're supporting BBI or not. Speaker, the process through which you've gone through to reach here today has been, in my opinion, quite treacherous. And that's why I'm very happy that finally this House has a chance to speak to what is in the bill. Mr. Speaker, I don't imagine that Kenya should go through a similar process in the future where a process for, you know, changing constitution should divide this country to a level where, in Parliament here, a member will look at you based on what he perceives. Mr. Speaker, you know, there's a book done by George Orwell called 1984. In that book, Mr. Speaker, the state can look at you like this and he already knows what you are thinking. The state can look at you and get to know this one is this way. And that's why when this whole process was going on, it was so difficult, Mr. Speaker, to be a member of parliament. They will look at Uching, he doesn't support Raila, therefore he supports Ruto, and therefore he opposes BBI. This is what we've gone through as members of parliament. I'm happy this is coming to an end. Because members cannot be asked to check their minds every time they want to talk on, on, on issues, Mr. Speaker. And so, Mr. Speaker, in future, in my opinion, these kind of processes, especially for members of parliament, should be such that they know it will all end up here, the, the way it has ended up here today, and that we'll have our chance to do this. Mr. Speaker, we've had members of parliament being arrested. This happened during a very difficult situation, a pandemic. But this parliament is seen to be insensitive because we're giving too much energy to BBI than to other pressing matters, Mr. Speaker. And that's why the sooner we deal with this matter, in my opinion, Mr. Speaker, the better. Mr. Speaker, on to the substance of this bill, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this country, in my adult time, since 02, has gone through so many reforms, illegal reforms, constitutional reforms. We are looking for that to hold, hold. We are looking for that you know, silver bullet that will help this country move forward, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if there's any country that has so many laws, that is all legislated, it is Kenya. Mr. Speaker, and so this BBI has been, you know, brought forward and as one of those silver bullets, a panache. I don't think so, but at least I know that it has some provisions, Mr. Speaker, that if followed well through, could help this country chart a new path to prosperity. And that's why I support what appears now in clause three about the economy and shared prosperity. Mr. Speaker, is not hyperbole to say that in this country, the reason people fight for the presidency so hard is that people think that when you're president, then your region will benefit. When you're prime minister, the region will benefit. What happens now is that clause three talks about shared prosperity. It means from what is provided there that the resources of this country would then going forward be shared equitably. It will be shared with a view to ensure that if somebody is hungry in Turukana, the other person in Uganda feels hungry too. If someone is hungry in Mombasa, the person in Nyeri feels hungry too. 
That's what we mean. It's meant by shared prosperity and maybe shared, fa shared failure. So that we share our pain together, share our happiness together, and share our growth together, Mr. Speaker. And for me, this, Mr. Speaker, is so important that we are talking about ensuring that development in this country. Mr. Speaker, you know, we failed this country as a parliament in the last 10 years with this new constitution. We've given out our, pro, our, our authority to budget to the, to the executive. And that's why you see us members of parliament still have to lobby ministers, yet you have the power to make the budget here. Mr. Speaker, if you talk to members here, they'll tell you the way the minister of finance said this, the minister of agriculture said this, yet you have the power here. It's the power that we have to ensure that budget allocations, resources that we have as a country is shared across the board equitably to ensure that we grow together and share the growth of the country. Mr. Speaker, I hope, and I'm going to promote, propose an amendment after this bill goes through, to ensure that we have systems of ensuring that budget allocations, resource allocations, are given out equitably to every region, and we will be requiring that any minister, the Minister of Finance, before he brings a budget, the budget to this country, to this assembly, he must tell us how does that budget meet the requirements of Clause 3 of the Constitution? How does it promote our economy? How does it promote the idea of shared prosperity? How does it ensure that the whole country benefits and we grow uh, together, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, the bill talks about the responsibility of the citizen. Mr. Speaker, if you allow me to say, yes, use that word, Uzalendo, patriotism, love for country, love for country to grow and be a place that you are proud of, Mr. Speaker. And for the first time, you're going to be having, over and above the duties of the state, the citizens having the responsibility, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we move toward, forward together as a country. I would use this example. I, I hear most of the time, you know, people say that the community, of where I, the community from where I come, the Luos, they say we have fought so hard for this country. We fought so hard for the change in this country, Mr. Speaker. Yet, at the end of the day, you find that we are marginalized. When people are called out to go to the streets to fight for reforms, if someone dies in Eldoret, if there are 10, six are Luos. If 10 people die in Mombasa, if there are 10, six are Luos. Mr. Speaker, we are now saying that this should be something that every citizen, and that's why yesterday I had members talking about ensuring that we all have a duty to protect the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, it's important that citizens know their role, their duties, their rights and responsibilities as a speaker to ensure that in future it's just not two, three people on whose backs. The speaker is quite important because these two gentlemen said in the handshake document that they realized that for this country to grow, they have to seed some ground. They have to seed some of the things they, have they would have loved to do. And so we've put the growth of this country on the backs of very few people. Party leaders, some you know, tribal kingpins and all this. We want this now to be a shared responsibility for, 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 uh, for, for citizens and that the growth of this country then is something that all of us are proud of and are participating in the problem. So, Speaker, Clause 6 talks about the issue of fighting corruption. Cases being handled in a timely manner. So, Speaker, this is a matter that is close to my heart because this country bleeds. People die in this country. People can't get special services in this country because of corruption. Nothing else. Children can't access school. People can't get medical services. People are going hungry because of sharks, corruption, and all this, Mr. Speaker. And, and for the first time we are saying that these cases must be finished within a fixed period of time, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I dare say that we, we, we may need, after this goes through, as an assembly, to ensure that we put more stricter measures, Mr. Speaker. I've always joked, Mr. Speaker, I, I respect the law, yes, but if I were to become president, Mr. Speaker, tomorrow, if I become president tomorrow, I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, a couple of men will, will have to die in this country. Because we can't have people stealing, they are disturbing the country, they have bought the courts, they have bought everywhere. Mr. Speaker, if I was a president and tomorrow someone sold the money, I'll send you to the airport and I'll kill you along the way. I won't allow you to leave. Because we have a country where we know who is stealing from us, we know who they are, and they come to TV to tell us how they are not thieves. Mr. Speaker, they will not live in my regime, I can assure you. If there is a high judge or a Supreme Court judge who is taking money from litigants, I will kill him. If it is a member of this assembly, committee chair, person who takes money from ministries that is oversighting, I will kill him. So that we have a proper country that is clean enough. We cannot be claiming we want to be clean and we are making doing deals with ministries here and there. That's because we need to talk corruption and deal with it. We cannot talk about corruption and hope it's going to go away. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, this particular you know, provision, in my opinion, Mr. Speaker, is so important. And I hope 
that the judiciary that you're now strengthening and giving so much money will take you. We cannot have a judiciary that cases spend 10, 15 years in court. Someone you know has stolen money. You can clearly see this hotel was bought using corruption money. And the guy is still starting around town saying the way he wants to run for governor or president. This has to be dealt with the speaker, and that's why I support this particular provision in this bill, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, part of why the two gentlemen came together was to ensure that we have something to deal with electoral theft being done away with, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in this country as we speak today, there's something that is creeping into our politics, what I would call electoral authoritarianism, Mr. Speaker, where, yes, we do elections, but you know the results already. We are going to elections, yet we know that so and so will win, so and so will lose. Mr. Speaker, we cannot build a democracy by spread, spreading fear, by spreading rumors that you know the deep state wants so and so, the system wants so and so. Mr. Speaker, we must build confidence in our institutions, we must build confidence in our electoral process, Mr. Speaker. And that's why the provisions in this particular bill, as it relates to making sure that our elections are, are very important and we must support them, especially, Mr. Speaker, where they ensure that women are involved in elections without being asked to be nominated as long as they run, Mr. Speaker. Centering IBC to ensure that it has teeth to organize more transparent elections, Mr. Speaker, is so important, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, what I see in this bill, and, you know, Mr. Speaker, in, in law I come from, you say that when the Bangus catches the, the, the chicken, you chase the Bangus, but you also blame the chicken. Mr. Speaker, there are very good things in this bill. But then there are areas where we must blame the chicken too. That, Mr. Speaker, there is no rationale. I don't see it for myself. Why you would make this assembly move it from 290 to 360, Mr. Speaker, and number two, with provision in this same constitution that gives in endless numbers because if you don't get the gender balance, you're going to have to add more numbers until you fit that level. This house is now unlimited in number. You could be 600 people in this house next time. Mr. Speaker, this particular provision, Mr. Speaker, that uh, clause 10 and 13, that talks about adding 360 Mr. Speaker, I think was ill-conceived and must be reconsidered. And even if it has to remain, Mr. Speaker, the IBC is, I mean, two individuals cannot decide how many constituencies are going to be created. They have no tools. They have no systems to do that. IBC has a system of ensuring that the numbers of people, the geographical requirements are, are met. The young people must now learn. The young people, uh, as proposed in this particular uh, a, a bill, Mr. Speaker. They must ensure that the Youth Commission serves them. It does not be a place for employing people, but one that ensures that their issues are covered not just at the national level, but at the ministries and at the county level, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank you and hope that provisions on financial, financial uh, uh, cases are able to be handled to ensure that we as a country move forward. I thank you and support the bill, Mr. Speaker. Member from where? Member from where? Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Honorable Speaker, uh, for giving me this chance to contribute to this very, very important uh, bill, Mr. Speaker.